much. My name is Henry Johnson. I am the Chief Operating Officer for Wealth Management at Northern Trust. Um, I also have a long history of working with artists and artists' estates and collectors. Um, and I can tell you firsthand that you're in for a real treat in this conversation today. Um, as you know, uh, we have a, a series of panel discussions taking place uh, around an interactive conversation on the art of collecting. It's a series of five panels. Uh, on the art market, on institutional and philanthropic engagement, and the potential of new technologies, the ethics of collecting, um, incredibly important conversation particularly today, and how, how we support artists, not just here in the United States, but internationally. This conversation is entitled Building Value in a Collection and is presented in partnership with Risk Strategies and Art Review, uh, two institutions represented on our panel. Um, let me spend just a moment introducing you to, to uh, your panelists today. Um, the, the session is going to be moderated by Mark Rappelt, who is the editor-in-chief of Art Review. Um, and the panelists include Chris Wise, for, vice president at Risk Strategies, Aaron Cesar, who is the director of the Delfina Foundation, and the collector Benedicta Badia Nordenstahl, all together in conversation around exploring the many facets of building value within an art collection. Um, and rather than, than my spending more time detailing it for you, I think I'll just turn it right over to the panel. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to, uh, just at the beginning, express our gratitude to uh, Northern Trust and to Expo Chicago for inviting us here to have this conversation. And it's a real honor to be with such a distinguished panel. Um, the subject of value is complicated um, because I think in many ways um, value means different things to different people. It can be economic, it can be aesthetic, it can be social, it can be many, many things. And when I was thinking about this conversation, I was uh, remembering a conversation I'd had with John Berger, one of the founder writers at Art Review, uh, shortly before he died when he was saying that during his lifetime, which is pretty much the entire post-war era, um, he changed a lot over that time, but the art market hadn't changed one bit. And he described the art market as um, a disastrous relationship between art and property. And he used to tell this story um, to illustrate this, uh, which was about a family that bought a painting, in, a D Dutch painting in the 17th century. And it got traded, inherited, pulled down. In the 20th century, someone identified it, an art historian identified it as a Rembrandt. And the owner was suddenly very, very rich. 10 years later, someone identified it as a copy from the school of Rembrandt, and suddenly he was a lot less rich. Um, and in the end, he gave it to an artist, thinking it was kind of not really worth anything. And the artist used it to get a very small loan to support his family, while his art failed to do that. Um, then when that guy died, it was suddenly attributed to a follower of Rembrandt who had died age 32 and painted only eight paintings, and this was one of them, and suddenly they were rich again. Um, and the moral of the story, um, John would say, is that um, the only value in a work of art is the fact that it's worth seeing. Um, but I thought maybe that would be a good way to start sort of um, trying to figure out in a way how you guys uh, value the art you collect or work with um, yourselves and what things are important. You don't have to, but I'm going to make you. <laughs> Well, uh, many times I'm asked that, oh, who, what, what is the, the most expensive work you own? And oh, I always answer the same question. I, I think art is part of the public realm. It is of public interest. It has a role in society. Um, and that kind of role, I value more uh, how significant and relevant an artwork is in terms of like developing new narratives or um, thinking in collectively than the, individ the market. We I buy against the market many times, so I, div I would divide very well, like I have a very clear that I have to divide what is the quality, the relevance, the significance of the artwork versus the speculation and the and the impositions of the market. But are those qualities you have your own criteria for? Or does it come from a common sense? I mean, where does your personal taste? And I guess also, have you ever bought something you don't like? <laughs> well, I do buy a lot of things I don't like. <laughs> that's, a, that's a key. Talking about art. 
right? You know, yeah, I buy things that I don't like in the art world. Um, I think the most the most important thing is that we've been since very for for years and years we've been indoctrinated into concepts of of uh, value is is a is a social contract is a convention the same paint uh, blob you know, on the floor we step on it we put it on a canvas and it's worth it's a Rothko worth millions and so by convention if it is in a canvas and in a certain space we it's a well, basic Duchamp Messi's I'm Argentinian so <laughs> Messi's t-shirts are ninety dollar t-shirts signed by Messi is like, I don't know, $5,000. So it is by convention that the signature changes the... So in my case, um, what I really mostly value about artworks is um, any kind that represent any kind of social system or mechanic or praxis that has been uh, devised and systematically applied to um, change our behavior from like what kind of color we use, what's cool, what's not cool, pink for girls, light blue for boys, uh, concepts of beauty, um, gender, uh, gender stereotyping, sexual permissions, rituals, religion, uh, even what's, what's proper and what's not proper. So I delve specifically on that, on, on thinking, we don't even know how unconsciously we are directed by by the by someone, by the others, or by some systems. And that, for me, challenging the statu quo, uh, making people think, uh, "Wow, I never thought of this." Or when when they look at an artwork in my in my collection, that is what I value a lot. And Chris, you deal partly in a realm that's much more related to the economic value. Yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm the straight man for this uh, panel. <laughs> Saying the truth. <laughs> so I, my, in, in my role, I'm very much concerned with protecting the economic value of an artwork. But as everybody knows who participates in the art world, the economic value of an artwork is a fungible thing. And so I think that what my role is, because I'm not an appraiser, I'm not an actuary, I'm not a dealer, I'm not a curator, I'm not a collector. My role is to be a facilitator and to prompt um, my clients and other people with the question of, if something is lost, what would make you whole again? Right? Because that's the fundamental premise of insurance. And with art, as you know, it could be a, the minimum would be the uh, total value of the materials that are used to create it. Right? So it's the sum total of the canvas and the paint and maybe the time to create it. But as everybody knows who's here, that's not even close to what the actual economic value is, no matter how it's measured. And so depending on who the owner is, that economic relationship can be very different. I work with a lot of artists. I work with a lot of artist estates. And the artist's studio is this sort of alchemy, where it goes from the canvas and the paint and the time that it's created to a market value. And some collectors that I work with, you know, the ones that are very plugged into the market, they want to protect not only the amount of money that they invested initially, but the accumulation that has happened because of the market. And there's a path for that conversation. And then there are the artists who really will cr create the work again. And really, they want to be made whole for the time and the effort that they put into it. And then there are foundations and institutions where the economic cost of ensuring all that artwork would exceed and eat into their capacity to do programming and fulfill their mission. So then it's a very philosophical conversation about um, if this were all lost, what would we need to do the next thing? If the Art Institute of Chicago burned to the ground, God forbid, what would the Art Institute's board and their, and their leadership, what would they do? Would they go out and buy there's no way. So they would have to do something that's different. And that is ends up always being a conversation around value. It becomes a conversation around values. And it's a different answer depending on where you sit in that, in that uh, sort of wheel of understanding of art. But I guess in, at the same time, the art world you're describing, a lot of the ideas of value are based on belief and faith. Right beyond the material value, and trust. yeah, 
and trust. But that's where I stop talking and I let somebody who has a vested interest in this pick up the conversation because at the end of the day, what I provide is a check. And that's very limited. I'm happy to take your check anytime. <laughs> um, <laughs> so maybe if I could just jump in, that I'm, I kind of, I maybe in one way I kind of represent the institution side of things, but then I also don't because um, Delfino Foundation does not collect. We are nonprofit. We also do not sell. So maybe in some way I also have a neutral kind of position here. But one of the reasons why I think I'm sat on this panel is because we offer uh, residencies for artists, curators, and increasingly collectors as part of an area of research we have called Collecting as Practice, which looks at the politics of collecting, the psychology of collecting, and the philosophy of collecting. And we engage artists you know, who build collections and archives as part of their practice, we engage institutions who are questioning the historic value of the collections that they have at play. We are based in London, uh, a city that uh, once was the capital of uh, the world's largest empire. And a lot of our historic collections come from a period of let's say trauma, they were amassed or looted in some cases. Um, so engaging artists and curators with institutions to interrogate, to intervene in these collections, kind of have created a different kind of value around kind of the, the institutional collections. And then thirdly, um, we've included residencies for collectors, um, for individual collectors who are interrogating their role and responsibility kind of in the kind of art ecosystem, but also in society at large. And when we first started these residencies for collectors, we were interrogating, not necessarily well, we're, on one hand, we're interrogating value, you know, economic versus social value of collecting, but we're also interrogating what actually is a collection, who defines a collection. Going back to thinking about institutions and their role in forming connect, uh, collections and making choices about which stories are told, which things are conserved for future generations, how things are displayed. With individual collectors, we started kind of inviting those who were quite like Benedita, who was our 15th collector in residence at Delfina Foundation. Um, those that are connected in, collecting in some way maybe not necessarily align with the market. So uh, among our very first group of collectors included um, uh, Harold Kabuzian from Turkey, who uh, collects predominantly, makes, I should say exclusively film and video by artists and works around new media. Um, Lu Xun from Nanjing, China, who, whose family arguably collects architecture. They have a, a park where they've built 25 buildings um, by artists and architects they commissioned conceptual designs from. And it's included people like Ai Weiwei to a young David Adjay, his, his design was realized kind of 15 years ago, to Luba Mikhailova, a Ukrainian collector who lost her entire collection. So she came into residency with nothing, but with, not to say not with nothing, but it's no objects, but with an incredible kind of like story about what those objects meant to her when they were lost in the 2014 war between Ukraine and Russia that took over Donetsk, which is where she is from and where she commissioned artworks for a landscape um, that included um, 50 buildings. It was a former factory. Um, it was works by Daniel Berin, which became scrap metal by the pro-Russian separatists. Um, works by Karatea, which were blown up. Um, and, but in, in any case, we, we looked at collections in a very different way. What happens when you lose them? Going to go back to your, your point here. And as a whole big... Um, legal and insurance conversation we could have about what, what happened in her case. But as uh, we moved on with the residencies for collectors, they really became about the role and responsibility of collectors in society and thinking about value in its wider sense. Sorry. I mean, I guess one of the things you're talking about there is, is the way with pretty much all institutions worldwide, not every single one, but most, um, it's private collections that generate the institution. So private passions then become part of a public discourse, which I think is partly what you were saying, Renatetta, about the uh, nature of your collecting. Mm -hmm. It's also to kind of push this into a public sphere, to take something out of a private studio to some degree, and then also to shape it in terms of public discourse and how that can interact with a broader social sphere. Well, yeah, I be, basically our collection, I believe collecting is a political exercise and also a social responsibility. And actually, when I came to Delfina, I harassed Aaron for, and we met in Dubai. I said, I want to talk about the non-sexy of the art world, what, what happened, like how, how the backstage, because many collectors do not connect, connect with the object, not with the human being behind the, the work. Um, 
and something we've been working a lot on social change making using the collection as a as a tool but as well like we we engage in a lot of projects around the world about with social change makers and um some there's a there's a phrase that one of our friends said that that for me it's key it is when the private will or the private you know la voluntad privada becomes uh, um, a, a public condition so so in spanish would be cuando lo privado toma condición de público um, and that in our countries specifically um, in the global majority ca countries occupies a space in the public realm where we are supposed to, the government's supposed, the state is supposed to, and you know, and, and so many times a private enterprise or a private collection starts giving to its community what, because they don't have a museum, because they don't have an ecosystem. So for me, I would say like seven or eight years ago, I started thinking not in terms of the transaction, the acquisition, but in terms of what do we do with that? What do we? What, what's beyond um, uh, acquire, the, the act of acquiring, a, or, you know, the transaction of acquiring a work? I mean, I think it's interesting because it relates in a bit to what Aaron was saying earlier about um, colonial collections, mm -hmm. and that like the nature of collections is partly that what may be valued socially at one point might not be valued socially at a later point. I wonder, Chris, if that's something that factors into your calculations. It's hard to put that alchemy back. I mean, you know, one of the things, as you were saying, Benedicta, that I was thinking is that, you know, is, is that more uh, attention to the transaction, I think, and, the, and the, those who benefit downstream from the transaction, that's usually not considered in the public discourse, you know, and so, you know, I, I was thinking to myself as as I was, you know, because I'm, I'm focused on the, really the question on what is lost if an object is lost. And in that, using that paradigm, it seems as that the transaction is actually one of the most important parts of that, um, that relationship with the artist because it's the thing that sustains the artist, it sustains the gallery, it sustains the people that make the artwork. But then there's more to it, right, that happens next. Well, I, I, I'm many times asked that, uh, like when, how many works did you buy in a year? And I said, the actual moment I pay the work is not the moment I buy the work. I've been working with the gallery in the, like in a journey of let, you know, learning about the artwork, seeing how it connects with the rest of the collection. So maybe the, it's, I, I paid 2022, but I started buying it in 2015, <laughs> I don't know. So what, what you're saying is true, that there's a whole focus on a how many, that's not my case. I mean, maybe that's a good point as well to move the thinking towards collections as a whole rather than a series of individual works. And um, do you think about the collection as a whole as you're putting it together? And do you also, Chris, think about the collection as an intact thing? Um, yeah, I mean, what I think about is really sustainability, right? So depending on where you are in the world and the and your and your, the amount of resources you have i would say that most people and organizations and institutions do not have unlimited resources and so one of the things that insurance does is it provides um, some some resources for the next thing so if something is gone then what are you going to do are you going to buy it again and when i think about the obligation that collectors have when they make an investment in an artist, make an investment in a piece of art. I think that in order for the art collector to behave responsibly, they, it's not just their, uh, their, their own personal balance sheet that's affected if something's lost, it's really the whole community. And so if, there are, if a work of art is destroyed, the work of art's ability to connect with the community is also destroyed. And that part of it, it's hard to create a economic value. However, there is a mechanism to replace the monetary value, at least of that initial investment. And that can be redeployed back into the art market to do the magical things that an art community and an art economy can do, which is you know, pay for the rent in the studio, pay for the catalog to be published, pay for the dealer to come to Expo and to keep, keep going. And that sort of dialectic between buying and showing and having the underpinnings of that are 
some financial products and and a, and a, and also um, an awareness of where the collector sits in this ecosystem. I mean, I think I had the experience of dealing with a, a collection that was really interesting in that regard because it was Napoleon's collection of stuff he'd <laughs> evacuated from Egypt. Um, and the great thing about this collection <laughs> was that he'd had his name carved into every single sculpture and the date he discovered it. <laughs> um, and I think there's another thing about collections is the history of the owners as much as they are relating to the artists and they have these other afterlives that are also quite interesting. I want to quickly point out that this image that you're looking at now is an Indian artist, Avni Tanya, in the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum. And it kind of relates to this conversation because we jointly invited um, her to come into residency between the Victoria and Albert Museum and Delfina to respond to the South Asian collection. And she had lots of questions and concerns about how objects made their way into the collection, how they were displayed, um, also, and, and actually what choices were made along the way, right? Right, in terms of preserving this you know, um, artifact versus another. And instead of taking these institutions, she decided to take it to her colleagues, to other artists, to curators. And what was produced was an alternative guide to the v as kind of South Asian collection. So I think interpretation is a very important part of this, but also interpretation itself changes. We recently just finished a curatorial fellowship with Tate, and it was with an individual who spent six months with the research team at Tate revisiting every single, not every single, but many descriptions of how, uh, of objects within a collection. And to look at how racism, um, sexism, um, colonialism, um, white supremacy were reinforced through the language used by the institution and how it had to be unpicked over time. In fact, apparently there's some, some large spreadsheet somewhere at Tate with how language has changed throughout each and single decade that, that articulates and contextualizes a certain kind of like object. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting as well that you bring up language in that context because I guess you all in different ways work with collections and collectors that span kind of quite vast geographies. Like yours like from Latin America all the way through to Southeast Asia, uh, where things have different resonances, um, different ways of being understood and different contextual languages as well. And I wonder what your experience is having to deal with that in a within the context of a single collection is? Well, when we look at a, an artwork, uh, for the first thing we, we really care for is that the art the artist is very uh, embedded and connected within his own locality. or uh, So they, they know they're talking about their own, you know, the, bas the basic premise starts from their own locality. Then they have to understand themselves within a region. And after that, they have to very be uh, very aware on what is the role in within the geopolitical game in the art world. If the, the, so when we look at the body of work of an uh, of an artist, sometimes we don't buy the masterpiece or the better work, but we want we we buy one that transcends and can be understood in any kind of context, because it transcends its own locality, the region, and then has a relevant conversation within the international community. Um, and, and many, some, yeah, the case of, for example, we just bought two works of Ming Wong. I, I think his best work is uh, for Malay stories, but it's so Singaporean, so Singaporean, that we chose a life of imitation in the end, which is also an amazing work anyway. But yeah. Uh, um, I think when I moved to Asia, um, the first two to three years, I, I worked with the concept of competence. I was incompetent. I, I didn't know if an artwork was good or if it was so foreign to me that was so overwhelmingly fantastic. So I allowed it to you know, go, go and I started decanting. Um, but I, 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 I buy with my ears and my heart not with what they tell me. <laughs> that, uh, maybe something just kind of not related, but maybe kind of related, about the preciousness to kind of, of objects. And I think that going back to interpretation, some artists are less precious about kind of how the objects are, are presented or displayed or conserved. They don't actually kind of like care. And I wonder for you, kind of like Benny, does that matter to you kind of like very much? Or do, you, do you enjoy the license that you have, for example, to display works, um, to care for works? 
Yeah, definitely. I take uh, a lot of liberties, like a freedom. I play a lot with the collection. It gives me great pleasure to hang it, to to have jokes between artworks. Sometimes one comes in and doesn't get a. Uh, they're like friends for <laughs> for me. They it doesn't get along with the others, and we have to rehang a whole sector just because that work is too masculine and is bullying others <laughs> for me. Um, yeah, yeah, I took, and, and I mean, I'm formally trained as a curator, but, um, but I am not, I, I do my own institution. It's very, it's a very personal and amorous relationship between me and my collection, um, yeah. Can I ask another question about preciousness in terms of like from kind of the kind of insurance kind of point of view? Um, I mean, a lot of collectors want to make their, not all, but a lot of them want to make their collections public. This goes back from the personal passion to public discourse. In order to do that requires kind of loan agreements. It requires ensuring that works can be presented in a certain way, which requires a certain level of, you know, um, humidity, energy, in a short, uh, uh, temperature, all, all this sort of stuff, which has a direct kind of impact to kind of on the environment. And there's, I mean, there's been a lot of efforts around the climate um, gallery, there was a gallery climate coalition. In fact, Benedita, when she did a residency in London, we sat down with Victoria Siddle, kind of, 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 of the gallery climate coalition. And we were talking about um, how some sector changes need to be considered in order to kind of think about the cost versus value. Right, the economic uh, and environmental cost relations. I mean, that's such an interesting question because the, each individual artist and their practice is also informing that dialogue. So I was just thinking as we were talking, you know, Ellsworth Kelly at one end of the spectrum where those objects, you know, if there's a little tiny scratch or a tiny piece of paint that comes off of them, the value of that work is significantly depreciated, it's significantly impacted. And then I was thinking on the other end of the spectrum, you have artists like Ansel McKeefer, where there is sort of this obsolescence that's planned and built into the work. And I actually think that, you know, there's a, there's a hubris on the part of the artists who don't regard the permanence and the, the long-term viability. But I actually think that, you know, that saddles museums with a considerable amount of responsibility to make it them that's pushing the standards. And I actually think that, you know, artists who create these very precious, very specific, very exact works are also the ones that are helping to drive the requirement that this standard is maintained. And I think it's a much larger conversation for everybody than, um, than, than just the museums who seem to get saddled with all of the baggage from society. Um, they have that, they stick their necks out a little bit. So now we're talking about um, repatriation, we're talking about climate change, we're talking about you know, social impact. I'm fantastic that museums are maybe some of them begrudgingly, but still leading the charge on that. But I think that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the collectors, it's the artists, it's, it's, it's a much bigger it's a much bigger thing than just one one part. But I think there's also a kind of mathematics to this. That in the end, if everything is collected and everything is preserved, um, you're going to end up with like institutions the size of a small planet. Well, this is the Smithsonian's um, conceit. This is their active problem, right? Which is that there's a there is an unsustainability in the in just the act of collecting, right? I mean, if 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 the Smithsonian, as an example, um, if they have a mandate to add whatever it is, 100, 1,000 works to the collection each year. I mean, there's some very simple math that tells you that that can't, that can't be sustained. Um, well, 95% uh, uh, of the world's patri museum patrimony is, is in storage, and only 5% of the museum's patrimony is shown a year. So increasing the patrimony of museums um, actually, for me, is a conflictive uh, problem. I mean, it's a conflict for me um, because the museum is a validating in the market as a validating indicator. Oh, he got into the MoMA collection. No, honey, you didn't get into the MoMA collection. You got into the storage of MoMA, which is not the same. So. Um, so don't come and sell me an artwork saying, you know, no, when you have been decontextualized, when you have been in-depth thought about your work shown, done programming, digested, that's when you got into the MoMA. Because 
and it's also a game. And, and, uh, and one thing that many, many friends ask me, oh, I was invited to, to the Southeast Asian group of acquisitions of Tate, what should I do? And I say, well, if you invest and support your ecosystem in Southeast Asia is one thing, but you need to be very careful that when you are supporting, uh, increasing the patrimony of a museum in an hegemonic center, you're actually not only increasing their patrimony, because this is how the global majority has been you know, offered to participate in the conversation. It's just, okay, buy works for us. Sorry, museums. <laughs> but um, you're, you're, you're occupying a space and you're, you're, um, you're, represent, you're, you're basically, um, you're, you're buying or you're occupying the space to represent the, com the conversations of your region within an hegemonic cultural center. It's not the same, but the market forces, you know, oh, got in, show in the Tate or this and that, and everybody wants to buy. And so as long as we keep on uh, pairing value to museums, to the walls of our museums, which is an illustration academic will, um, Market for me, market indicators need to change first. I guess there's also something something fundamentally extractivist about what you're describing as well, um, and I think you can never kind of get around that. To support a region by taking things out of a region doesn't really support the region in any way. Well, we had this conversation of this like ex, ex, how would we call it in, in documenta extractionist uh, via biennials policies and. Uh, and I have, I, I'm very radical about <laughs> these things. I think, yeah, there is like the, the relevance of these big biennales or big shows in, in museums uh, many times has an extractionist policy from our regions, but also on the other hand, our regions are capitalizing on the exposure uh, of, it, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it takes two to tango. I, I don't believe there's like so much ingenuity in between, between uh, you know, I, I don't believe it. But yes, obviously there's always questioning and it has to be, que uh, these formulas have to be questioned. I mean, you, you mentioned Ming Wong earlier. And of course, although he's a Singaporean artist, he hasn't for some time really lived in Singapore. Um, and part of the system I guess it's partly a reflection of what Singapore's like, but also a reflection of the opportunities elsewhere, luring people away, which relates to, I think, collecting and the market as well, is that it doesn't become sustainable to stay in um, a place like Singapore if you really want to sell to major collections. And it's interesting to me that, as you've been talking, the collections we're talking about are Tate, the Smithsonian. We're not talking about National Gallery Singapore. We're not talking about those other institutions that do exist in these regions. For me? Yeah. You're well, actually, the National Gallery of Singapore and SAM have an amazing, I, I really admire what they're doing, which is like, um, so, so collections, traveling collections, initially were, went around the world to educate the public. So, so they brought to Latin America, to wherever, uh, or to even Singapore, to show impressionists, to show, you know, I don't know. Um, it doesn't make sense for us to have in, um, in the, um, the, the what's the name of the, not the temporary, no, the other one collection of a museum. Permanent. But the permanent, thank you. The permanent museum to have European art, like, like come because it doesn't make sense. So Singapore, in the case of National Gallery and Sam, they're actually buying Southeast Asian art and they bring temporary, you know, canned exhibitions to educate. But during the formation of all of the museums in Latin America or in the global majority, the elite of our, those countries who traveled to Europe dismissed completely the local, the vernacular culture, and then, then went to Europe and bought all this art that was supposed to, that was art. And so in the case of the Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes in Argentina, it's full of European art and it doesn't coincide with it, it, there, there's an artist that talks about orthopedia, like that like we've like sort of embedded a foreign object into our bodies of culture. Are, are, and then we think it's ours. Like you, you're gonna. Why do you go to Buenos Aires to see like a 
bad Van Gogh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like because even that, I'm the same with Maspi, the the work that Adriano Pedrosa is doing on decolonizing the collection. They don't have Volpi, but they, now they have. But but Volpi, who's an amazing Brazilian artist, uh, but they do have like twenty Leger, uh, I don't know how many Picassos. So so that was a construction and of the culture at the moment, at that time. And now it, that is also being very contested worldwide. But I think this is also an, a great important role for collectors too, in those regions, to kind of create initiatives that could support the local ecosystem and do so in a way that is holistic and supportive to institutions that are already there. Because often what you also see is collectors setting up their own initiatives, which are basically mirroring what's already there. Um, and, and, you know, we know in, in a case of like, let's say China, for example, the plethora of private museums that don't have very much kind of content, which are then of course competing against each other for resources, um, which is doing no one of any kind of, in, in, of any good. So when we do have, for example, collectors and residents at Delphine and they're coming with an idea of something they want to support, we're always making sure they understand the local landscape truly and deeply and ensuring that this new initiative is going to fit like a glove into kind of the existing ecosystem. So something just to be really thoughtful about for those of you who are collectors who are thinking about one day setting up a public initiative is ensure that it relates very much to the local kind of kind of art scene and really think twice about whether you, know, you need to set up a museum or just support the, resident, the, the museum that's there or the same with the residency or any other kind of initiative. I mean, I guess that's the counter to that we're also currently we're talking a lot about the circulation of artworks and how they move around the world and i wonder chris in terms of insurance and things like that is it going to get harder and harder for a lot of these artworks to be circulating in the way they yeah are? from a physical point of view it it is there's a number of different factors that are contributing to that um the two of them are most most i think i think obvious which one is there's climate change that's happening and it's putting pressures on coastal communities, communities that are in the, um, in the desert, communities that are subject to wildfire and all that kind of thing. Those pressures are not just art. Art is a, some property that's also, you know, homes, there's businesses, there's all that. Um, but there's also political pressure. Um, you know, I was just reading, actually, there's a memo from some trading partners of ours in London. Uh, political violence is an increasing risk. Uh, Ukraine has, that loss is, still being tabulated, um, and the forces that are pushing um, the conflict in Ukraine are not limited to Ukraine. And so, um, you know, there's an art fair in Taipei, for instance, a very prominent art fair. Everybody knows that there's significant political pressure uh, between China and Taipei. So there are big concerns about the moment you know, if there's an art fair there, if there's a moment where there's conflict, what happens to the work of art there? And there is, there is a, there will not be insurance options to protect that. Um, you know, when, you know, very interestingly, when um, there's demonstrations in Hong Kong, um, there's a considerable amount of art that's in Hong Kong. Some of it was on its way back to the airport. One of the very interesting things was the Chinese government said that the um, uh, the protesters were terrorists, right? So that language is very important. That definition triggers or some exclusions in insurance contracts. And so there becomes a debate between um, the various parties, the owners of the artwork, the institutions, the artists. Do these definitions, these political definitions, these legal definitions, do they, do they, do they make what we're trying to do more challenging? And I think that the, in aggregate, those are going to end up being limiting factors in this sort of global um, circulation of art. And I think that the, the, the market, I don't think, has caught on to this yet. Um, but it's, I can tell you here now, it's coming. And the, actually, the institutions are a little farther along in thinking about this because I think that they're, you know, the, the incentives for taking a chance, I think the museums are more thoughtful. I think that the dealers are, you know, they're more motivated by their short term potential gains. And, and we are egg <laughs> selfish. Yeah. The collectors, the are, collectors the, are, are the, the worst. Yeah. yeah, and driving it, right? You create the economic incentive to go bring X number of dollars to Taipei and roll the dice as this is the day that it's going to change. We cannot be talking about climate change and then having I don't know how many private jets with exactly. one person inside. Yes. When Victoria Sidal told me, if you will fly coach, this is your carbon footprint. And if you fly 
business. This is a kind of footprint. They're like, no, no. But, but also in that <laughs> same conversation, we talked about kind of transport by ocean and by air exactly. and, it's, and, or, and by land. Exactly. And the significant difference that is. And like, and there's a, a nice, on the gallery, Climate Coalition kind of website, there's like a carbon kind of calculator. And Thomas Dane Gallery, um, it looked at his entire carbon footprint, which you can look at as a gallery or even a nonprofit space. And 45% of their carbon emissions came from transport, kind of like. I can, I can tell you that the, the sea freight ideas may be DOA because there there are there's so many losses that happen through certain things by I don't know if anybody was paying attention to the news but there was a, a, a container load of BMWs that was on fire in the Pacific earlier this year and the you know the one of the things that that the pandemic has brought into relief I think these problems existed before but there are worker shortages and there's capacity issues at all of the ports all around the world and so they became those those logistical problems got worse, and so what happens is that the the boats stay in port longer, take longer to offload. There are things that happen at sea that have been for since we've been well, traveling. In by our sea. case, we, our whole household, when we moved from Singapore to Chicago, we had two containers of household and one container of the color of the works we had in Southeast Asia. Uh, we ended up flying the, the collection yeah. because the the containers, it was like still COVID, spent maybe two months on in a pipe, you know, in the sun, tropical weather. And then the the ship arrived to North New York port and they told them there's no space. So it had to go to Canada. It had to like, imagine a collection with like uh, on the sea, you know, even if it, there's and, and there was a lack in Asia, a complete lack of refrigerating, yeah. refrigerated well, the, the, the insurance community has gotten wise to this challenge. And instead of we'll think about it, it may be a little bit more expensive. The answer increasingly is no. At least in America, as we are now, you can you do it by road <laughs> and by land. Yeah, yeah. Um, sadly, that's the end of our time. But um, I'm sure uh, you'll want to go and sniff the galleries outside <laughs> in a second. Um, but I'd like to thank the panel and thank you also for being here.